where the water was circulating directly through the reactor core. Oh no. <laughs> Today we're going to be looking at a channel called Kento Bento. Specifically, how this lake in Northwest Asia got deadlier than Chernobyl. I think I know which accident he's referring to, but let's see. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Tyler Fulce. I'm a nuclear engineer with a little over 10 years of experience in the commercial nuclear power industry. From engineering and operations to emergency response. I'm claiming know everything there is nuclear, but I can certainly share some knowledge. Let's check this out. Central Russia, 1957. Mm, Villagers yeah. near the southern Ural Mountains were scared. They were terrified. Men claiming to be from the government had appeared out of nowhere, ordering people to leave their homes. I like these drawings, it's an interesting way to do this sort of thing. Without warning, they started burying crops and slaughtering livestock. Their livestock. The villagers were in shock. They were confused. Panic. What was going on? They were being forced away, but they soon realized it wasn't just their village. It was everyone's village. And some people looked ill. The yeah, this accident, it took a long time before people were fully aware of the actual impact. It's crazy. The only information given was that there had been an outbreak of a special disease, and everyone wow. needed to leave. But the source of this disease was a mystery. Was it the river? The lake? Was it the strange lights people saw in this? Worst thing you can do following any sort of emergency thing is telling something that is covering it up and covering it up with something that is completely different with how the emergency actually works. Because radiation does not spread like a disease. It's not contagious. But, of course, 1950s, Soviet Union... This is their attempt at a cover-up, which will result in more damage to human life than what would have happened if they just said what the hazard was and how to properly protect yourself from it. Guy, not long ago, nothing was revealed. They felt helpless. Looking back at their village, they were horrified at what they saw. Their homes were now on fire. Everything was being incinerated. This happened in 1957, yeah. but what led to this moment... Unnecessary protocol, but panicking. Much less extreme example would be, I guess, a bunch of people buying toilet paper for COVID, even though that's got nothing to do with anything. But people don't know what it is, so can you really blame them? No. Actually started 12 years earlier. Hiroshima, August 6th, 1945. 6,000 kilometers away, the United States kilometers. detonates a nuclear weapon during the final stage of World War II. Many people died, mostly civilians. Three days later in Nagasaki, it happened again. These events remain the only use of nuclear weapons in the history of warfare. The world became acquainted with the nuclear might of America. That's true. There were several other detonations, but he's right that still to this day, the only example of it used in an actual war. Though, I wonder in 1957 how many people actually knew about all of the nuclear weapons testing that was occurring, especially in the Soviet Union. Now, this did not sit well with the Soviet Union. After learning about Japan, Joseph Stalin decided that their existing nuclear program was insufficient and needed to be aggressively pursued. Falling behind the US in the development of nuclear weapons was not an option. But they first needed a location, a secret location, hidden from the rest of the world. They selected a remote area near the southern Ural Mountains in central Russia, about 1,800 kilometers from Moscow. For locational reference, the Ural Mountains is widely considered the northern border between Asia and Europe. This is where they decided to build their first ever plutonium plant, named Mayak. From 1945 to 1948, I've also heard this referred to as the Mayak disaster, the Kitchim disaster. There's a few other names. By the way, I'm sure I've butchered the pronunciation of those. This isn't one that's as widely talked about within the nuclear power industry strictly because it doesn't... This isn't a power plant. This is an enrichment plant. But still, it comes up because talking about poor emergency planning and poor um, radiological event response principles but it's a different different sort of radiological hazard just a different sort of facility 70,000 gulag inmates from 12 labor camps were forced into constructing this nuclear facility seven military reactors would eventually line the southern shore of lake kaziltash note though the lake reference in the title is not this lake that's another thing you'd never see i mean gulag workers probably not I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're probably not certified in all of the right materials and construction certs you need specifically for nuclear facilities. 
But even in the U.S., those standards weren't what they were back in the 1950s because nuclear was fairly new, both uh, with as weaponry and also as power plants, so enrichment facilities. I think a lot of those standards wouldn't have existed yet, but really all those standards around are being qualified on certain construction processes and certain equipment and certain safety QA, QC checks that you need going into building any of these kind of facilities. But I'm sure that didn't exist yet. Pre-Cold War tensions were mounting, so all this was done in a great hurry and in total secrecy. After construction, yeah. the plant immediately began processing and weapon- All kinds of red flags. Rushing it, unskilled, unqualified labor, and keeping it a secret. Organizing plutonium, with the greatest success coming in the form of the first plutonium bomb named First Lightning. So plutonium is way more energy dense than uranium, so pound for pound, it takes a lot less plutonium to make to make nuclear weapons. And especially here in 1949, um, thermonuclear weapons or nuclear fusion weapons didn't exist yet either, but even still, it's just more energy dense, at least. So when they get to those, the, uh, the fission stage doesn't require nearly as much material with the use of plutonium-239 compared to uranium-235. Which was detonated in 1949. But now, along with this secret facility, there was a need for a secret city where all the nuclear scientists, workers, and their families could live. And so the secret city of Chelyabinsk-40 was born. Chelyabinsk being the name of the nearest big city, 40. and 40, the last digits of the postal code. This place was also colloquially known. Interesting. That part I never knew. Like, I, I, I've heard uh, Chelyabinsk 40, but I've never heard, I, I never knew why it was called 40, but I guess that makes sense. And yeah, there are projects, you'll see, there are projects like this. I mean, the Manhattan Project kind of had places where people and their families can live while they did their project in secret, even ones that are not secret such as the um, Baraka nuclear power plant in the UAE. Well, first of a kind nuclear power plant in not only the UAE, but in that entire region, they're bringing in a lot of foreign help to uh, help construct those, to help construct that nuclear power plant. So what they did was they would offer pretty generous stipend housing communities for the spouses of the expats going to work on that facility. So you'll still see this to this day, and it doesn't always have to be something underhanded or secretive. It's just need needing additional help in the case of the uh, Baraka nuclear power plant. And even more common, like compounds with oil companies working in, in Saudi Arabia, for instance. As City 40, reinforced by barbed wire fences and guarded gates, no one was allowed to enter or leave the city. That's the sketchy part. <laughs> Don't know of anyone that had to deal with that. I mean, there were compounds, if you will, but it wasn't like a, wasn't like a labor camp, not that sort of thing. People that I knew that went to uh, work at Baraka were compensated quite well. Residents were forbidden to send letters or to make contact with the outside world. For decades, wow. this closed city of 100,000 people did not appear on any of the Soviet maps, and the identities of the inhabitants were erased from the official Soviet records. Those who had been relocated to City 40 by Soviet order of the Soviet Party were considered missing by their relatives back home. And mercilessly, if anyone refused to work at Mayak to live in the secret city, they would be taken to a prison camp and executed. So already pointing into more decay, more bad signs of an effective nuclear safety culture, uh, forced labor, these poor people that worked on this facility, they're not going to care about nuclear safety standards. They're treated horribly. Can't say you blame them individually. After all, by that time, they would have already been introduced to state secrets. City 40 is actually one of 44 known closed cities in Russia, wow. probably the most prominent of them all. But it's important to note that the Soviet Union did not come up with the idea. The concept of closed cities surrounding secret nuclear facilities. Yep, I knew about it with the Manhattan Project. It was a closed city. I've never heard that. I've actually never heard that term closed city, but just just a secret. Um, there were secret codes that are used to this day with uh, units of measure, like a shake being a unit of time. It's 10 nanoseconds. Gives you a sense of how fast nuclear reactions are. And a barn is 10 to the minus 28 power meters squared. 
gives you a sense of how small the uh, target sections are for individual nuclei. Because after all, you gotta have some fun secret units. Those are the two I know. I'm sure there are a zillion more. But those two still survive within the nuclear industry today. Was stolen from the United States when Stalin's spies intercepted plans for the Hanford nuclear plant, yep. which the secret city of Richland, Washington, was built around. Note, the Hanford nuclear plant had manufactured the plutonium that was used in the atomic bomb over Nagasaki. It wasn't just the idea of closed cities that was taken from the US, but much of the nuclear research and knowledge was gained directly from Soviet spy rings working in the Manhattan Project. Spying back then was crazy, so much for it being a secret city. As a result, there were massive gaps in the Soviet physicists' knowledge about nuclear physics, which was really, really bad when it came to safety. Work yeah, uh, <laughs> here's the sh big shiny thing that makes it go boom, but here's how, but the part on um, that says, whatever you do, don't, and then <laughs> bits, bits of pieces missing. I know that's an exaggeration, but that's crazy when there's a gap, and especially brand new nuclear technology used for anything on this sort of scale. Nuclear safety principles were just kind of being figured out. Because we're not protected, environmental concerns were not taken seriously, and shockingly, people were handling plutonium with their bare hands. They didn't know any better. Handling plutonium with your bare hands isn't, that by itself isn't gonna kill you. Now, if it, you know, bits and pieces get off and you get it in your mouth, then that's bad. Or you get some that stays on your hands, you know, you touch your face, you put your fingers in your mouth, that sort of thing. The dust getting inside your body, that's gonna be way more of a hazard. One, plutonium's a heavy metal. Generally a bad idea to have heavy med metals go inside your body. It could mess up your kidneys pretty bad. And two, of course, it's radioactive. Plutonium, in this case, far more radioactive. And here they're making weapons, so it's going to be pretty high weapons grade. So internal dose, yeah, it's going to be comparable, maybe even a bit worse in the case of, plutonium, of weapons grade plutonium if you were to eat it. So basically you have stacked effects of regular chemical poisoning and radiation poisoning if you get it inside you. So, ugh, that's horrible. Now a system was set up. Water from the nearby Lake Kaziltash and Tesha River was used to cool the nuclear reactors to prevent overheating. But there was a problem. They had implemented an open cycle cooling system where, where the water was circulating directly through the reactor core. Oh no. <laughs> Horrific design that would never be approved today. Reactor coolants are closed systems. Even the secondary loop in a lot of cases is also a closed system. That the part that goes to the, that sends steam to the turbine to uh, produce electricity and then back around again to feed the steam generator. You can see here for a pressurized water reactor, the orange reactor loop is closed, primary loop. The secondary loop going to the, from the steam generator to the turbine to the condenser back around is closed. Only loop going outward is the tertiary loop going straight to the condenser and back. That's all it does is cool the condenser pretty far away from anything radioactive. Here, the boiling water reactor. Now, the primary loop steam does go directly to the turbine and is recirculated back to the reactor coolant system, but the tertiary loop, the part that's actually in the environment going out to the cooling towers and a reservoir is still isolated from that. Point is, here you got something far, far worse. Which meant contaminated water was being discharged directly back into the lake and river. Yep. The same lake children played in every summer and the same river used as drinking water by the locals. And this is an active reactor. So this was a worse design than Chernobyl because this was especially considering this was an active part of that. Chernobyl still bad things had to happen. That was an accident. This is by design. That's insane. And we're not just talking about the residents of City 40 here, but also the numerous villages downstream the Tetra who were dependent on the river as a water source. 40 villages in total <laughs> with about 28,000 people. But it gets worse. Mayak had a storage problem. They didn't know what to do did. with their highly contaminated radioactive waste. So nothing's green, but I can tell he's doing this for illustrating the cartoon. Nothing's going to have a nasty green glow behind it. They tried storing them in underground tanks for a while, but the upkeep was inconvenient for them, as the tanks needed to be constantly Wow, inconvenient for them. ...constantly cooled to prevent self-overheating. So what did they do? They straight dumped the radioactive waste in the various bodies of water around Mayak. This included further contamination of the Techa River. Again, by design, 
poor waste management program. Nowadays, radioactive waste, the vast majority of it that's low-level waste, is recycled, which is more or less by doing laundry, because a lot of that stuff is slightly contaminated, like gloves, um, protective clothing, suits, those sort of things. And it can quite easily be recycled. Medium-level stuff, like water purification filters and resin for the reactor coolant system, those are stored on site until they can decay to natural levels and then are, dis and then are treated and discharged safely. And at that point, you're just putting water into more water because it's been decayed and treated, and treated. The real nasty stuff is put in these sort of canisters. And these sort of canisters are perfectly safe to be standing right next to. There's a lot of concrete between you and what's actually radioactive. The spent fuel is placed in there after it's had some time to decay and cool off in the spent fuel pool for uh, several years before it's located here. And these can be safely stored on site in a storage pad because these containers, they weigh on the order of 100 tons, and they can withstand severe weather, thunderstorms, tornadoes, hurricanes, even direct missile strikes. Pretty well safe. And some countries have even used boreholes and underground repositories to, to place these in. But the licenses for them to be placed on these pads are good for 100 years. And that's not doesn't mean they'll fail in a hundred years. They can always get license extensions to go even longer. The industry, these are the pro this is the proper way to deal with waste. This is not, which important to note connects to the River Ob, which flows into the Arctic Ocean. But not only that, the surrounding lakes became toxic reservoirs. We already oh, know yeah. about the contamination of Lake Kaziltash, but this lake in particular, Lake Ertyash, over time accumulated so much radioactive waste it became known to the locals as the Plutonium Lake. Or so here's some other, some other nasty tidbits. It actually takes a lot of radioactive material to get these lakes to be contaminated to the point where they'd be that hazardous to human other wildlife. But this is the Cold War. They're doing a lot of enrichment, a lot of activities over many years. So, and they're not using any safety protocols whatsoever. So if you were to, I don't know, throw all of these containers the men that I mentioned earlier, those 100, 100, 150 tons spent fuel pool containers into these lakes, it would be totally fine. The poor processing, the poor uh, separation of certain waste products, and the poor management of that, yeah, that's why this is so horrible. It's because they had no idea what they were doing. By the way, I'm not suggesting throwing uh, spent fuel containers underwater. That's a completely uncontrolled environment. I'm just saying even that wouldn't be as bad as this. Or the lake of death. Now, here's the thing. Neither of these lakes is the lake referenced in the title, which means there is a lake more deadly than even the lake of death. And it's this More one, deadly than lake death. Lake Karachay. A baby compared to the others, but packing a punch. A now that makes sense. There's so much less water to absorb all that hazard do hazardous dose, so... Even putting a little bit in there is going to make it so much worse. Radioactive punch. Sure, many of the surrounding lakes became regular dumping grounds for highly contaminated radioactive waste, but the dumping that took place at Karachay was next level. The combination of the proximity to Mayak, the fewer lakeside residents, and the more diminutive size of the that lake size made this huge. inconvenient and seemingly... That size is a huge thing. Less risky. It's more risky because not as much water is going to protect you from the radi... You might as well just be dumping it on the ground. By the way, none of it looks like grain sludge. A lot of it just looks like bits and pieces of metal. Some of those, like cesium-137, for instance, from any fission process, but it can be very deadly. Less risky option for open air storage. As such, significantly large amounts of solid, liquid, and gaseous radioactive material was constantly released into Karachay. That's another one. Um, solid waste, liquid waste, and gas waste are all stored separately. So they're not even, they're not even using the same sort of protocol that you should do with chemical waste or any other waste. Uh, man, they're, they are breaking all of the rules and it's tragic. More so than other lakes. With all this dumping, the people at Mayak ended up neglecting the underground storage tanks from earlier, which was not cool. No, literally, because the high level of radioactivity meant that the waste was heating itself through decay heat. In other words, pressure was building. Sure. So radioactive material still generates heat after the reactor has been shut down. 
not very much compared to a fully operational nuclear reactor. Talking 1% is a lot. After a while, it goes down to even a tenth of a percent, hundredth of a percent. But nuclear power plants are big. Uh, full power is on the order of 1,000 megawatts. So to give you a sense of scale, um, a microwave that you have in your house, about 100 watts, maybe 1,500 if you got a big fancy one. So a small fraction of a billion watts is still a, a good bit of energy we're talking about here. They had a cooling system in place, but it was a pretty crappy cooling system, and it was poorly maintained. It was just a matter of time until, well, rupture. Until this. September 29th, 1957. The cooling system for the storage tanks failed. A tank containing 80 tons of liquid radioactive waste exploded with an estimated force of up to 100 tons of TNT. 90% of radioactive material released was deposited within the vicinity of Mayak and City 40. But And that's effectively going to be like a really nasty... So 100 tons of TNT. Um, so kind of like Chernobyl, a lot of people compare it to like a nuclear bomb detonating. No, um, it's... It's not. The principles are have nothing to do with each other. No, no fissioning is occurring at this point. It's just, and his explanation was spot on. It's just a buildup of pressure, just like any other explosion. But this one is going to be salted with radioactive material, a lot of radioactive material, stuff that's far that's been sitting there. The amount of radioactivity here is going to greatly exceed is in an individual nuclear reactor because it's waste that's been sitting there for a while for a while now granted some of it's going to decay away but you're talking many many fuel cycles at this point the remaining 10 percent formed a radioactive cloud reaching a height of one kilometer the next 10 hours saw it drift northeasterly causing widespread contamination over hundreds of kilometers so any sort of radioactive release one of the first things you look at is the weather emergency procedures so if if it goes up in the air you need to see what direction it's the wind's going so you can notify which zones that need to either evacuate or shelter in place based on any plumes that could be coming their way i'm going to go out on a limb and say they didn't do any of this because this whole project was a secret and instead they go with the goofy cover-up this was the Kishten disaster, one of the worst nuclear accidents in history. The event was eventually categorized as a level six serious accident on the international nuclear event scale. Oh, this, this thing. Um, so I'm not going to argue with its classification, but let's just say this, this scale right here, when it comes to emergency planning at a nuclear power plant, this isn't even brought up. The criteria is highly vague and subjective. And probably the main reason why this wasn't classified at the maximum level was because it was a fairly remote area. So it's not going to be as high as Chernobyl. Fukushima was classified as a level 7 on the highest scale, even though the actual release and, dam and harm from radiation was essentially nil, at least compared to Chernobyl, but it had such a big impact in terms of how many people were evacuated. It was coupled with a earthquake and tsunami that destroyed large portions of the country. So that's what elevated that reading so high. So this scale does not necessarily mean the most hazardous in terms of how many people died, got the most dose, that sort of thing. It's kind of a weird thing. Only two incidents in history have been more severe, Chernobyl and Fukushima. You see, this is a thing. Um, this disaster killed more people than Fukushima, but it's rated lower. I got a problem with that. At level seven. However, in terms of the number of cases of acute radiation sickness, the Kishten disaster was actually four times worse than Chernobyl. Yeah, and now the death tolls, I'm, because of how secret this was, you never really know, but I've heard estimates um, upwards of 200, which would put it worse than worse than Chernobyl, with the UN estimate at Chernobyl being at 50. Now there's, there's a whole, so 
Now there's question marks on the Chernobyl death toll too. As for this one, so that's that's a whole can of worms that's debatable. But in fact, this one I would say has even more uncertainty around Chernobyl because Chernobyl they were unable to cover up, whereas this one was covered up for a lo for a long time. Due to the secrecy surrounding Mayak, the communities in the nearby affected areas were not immediately informed of the accident. Shockingly, it wasn't until a week later that the evacuation process started and really only for the communities closest to the contamination site. That's horrible because any release of radiation, the uh, the hazard is going to be worse initially because for um, short, the relatively short-lived stuff to decay away. Though since this one's in the case of waste, that might be that might be negligible in terms of activity of the actual contaminants. But yeah, a week of radioactive material coming your way, possibly affecting you and you not knowing about it, that's horrible. Understandably, the affected villagers were frightened by the sudden appearance of soldiers. They were ordered to leave their homes. Their crops were buried. Their livestock was slaughtered. Shock and confusion rang out as they were being forced away. Some villagers showed visible signs of radiation poisoning. But since the Mayak facility Burns. wasn't supposed to exist, the soldiers were not- Burns, nausea, vomiting, um, skin lesions, depending on how acute this dose is, those can be some, some early signs. Not allowed to reveal the truth of the situation, that it was radiological in nature. Instead, the villagers were told that there was an outbreak of a special disease, one that was unknown and mysterious even to them, and they needed to leave. Some Horrible. suspected it was related to the strange lights people saw in the sky. That's gonna have people think it's contagious, they're gonna be separating from each other, which is, you know, unnecessary when combating this sort of hazard. Uh, no. Hmm not long ago, but they weren't sure. After the initial evacuation phase, the abandoned homes and infrastructures had to be destroyed, much to the dismay of residents. All in all, at least 23 villages were incinerated. Yes. I wonder how many people were killed like as a direct result of these actions. For, so forget the, um, the radiation poisoning or the uh, increased cancer risk. I doubt this sort of emergency evacuation process occurred without any um, injuries or death. Some were evacuated after a week, but it took up to 11 years for all residents in the wider affected areas to be evacuated. In total, almost half a million people were exposed to radiation. There was sickness and death, and much of the surrounding land was left barren and unusable for perhaps centuries. With Mayak being a secret... The impact is is horrible, the, and the main reason why it's not talked about as much within the nuclear industry is because Chernobyl involved a lot of the operations and being a nuclear accident being a nuclear operational accident with a uh, reactor this involves technology that shoddily built and built stuff that wasn't really used anywhere else i mean chernobyl wasn't either but there were some analogs that you could apply whereas here it was just so out there in terms of no no other no other processes like that in other parts of the world at least at least not this bad and it was a secret for so long because this one happened it's like hey right in the middle of the soviet union so it even spread a few thousand kilometers away it's not like in was in ukraine where the plume could set off high rad alarms in scandinavia it was just that much further away so you can keep it that much more of a secret facility the soviet union had to deny the catastrophe ever happened yeah to that the fear of international condemnation which is why most people today tend to be aware of chernobyl and fukushima as some of the worst nuclear accidents in history even the three mile island incident but not so much Oh, Three Mile Island had a major impact on the industry in terms of additional safety protocols, procedures, creation of entirely new agencies. But I would not even put Three Mile Island on the same, remotely the same level as Chernobyl. Chernobyl and Kitchum, I think, deserve to be at the top. Kitchum deserves to be up there more than Fukushima. Yes, Fukushima was a nu was a nuclear accident as well, uh, brought on by. A, a storm, but the only reason why it's rated that high was because it was in a densely populated area, and that many of and so many evacuations had to occur. Fukushima just had the one death. Kishtim disaster, despite being comparable, if not worse, in many ways. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. But back to the lake, because Lake Karachay wasn't about to be upstaged by the Kishtim disaster. This lake accumulated 4.4 exabecquerels of radioactivity over time, which isn't quite to the level of radioactivity released. Still a big number though, I mean, yeah, it's comparable with Chernobyl. From Chernobyl, 
But if we were to break down the cesium-137 from each, which is the radioactive isotope that contributes to land contamination, the rest is too short-lived, Karachay ends up being significantly worse at three points. Yeah, cesium-137, it lasts longer and it accumulates. That's why it's worse. Six exabecquerels compared to Chernobyl's 0.085. There's a few ways to interpret this, but you can say Lake Karachay is arguably the most polluted place on Earth. Really bad, but at least by the 1960s, the lake was drying up. It was disappearing. The threat seemed to be lessening with each passing year. In 1967, a drought hit the region, lowering Lake Karachay. Yeah, cesium-137 has a half-life of about 30 years. That's why it's much more of a long-term hazard. Karachay's water level even further, to the point where much of the lake bed was exposed. This was seemingly good. Except that. No, because there's less shielding. <laughs> that wasn't. Because the previously submerged toxic sediment was now exposed to the harsh sunlight. It was drying out and forming dust. Deadly radioactive yep. dust. And all that was needed was a strong gust of wind and yet another horrifying disaster. Well, they didn't get a strong gust of wind. They got something far worse. A violent windstorm scattering across the region. Once again, half a million people were irradiated. The government finally had enough. They piled 10,000 concrete blocks on top of the lake. Prevent See, that's just it. Water is so good at absorbing radioactive material. It just gives you a sense of how much uh, radioactive material is in there if even with the lake it was that hazardous. So now getting rid of the water will just make your problem worse. It's like getting rid of the water in your spent fuel pool. Don't, don't do that. Preventing sediments from shifting and burying the remaining water under cement. It wasn't until 1989 onwards that the Soviet government declassified documents relating to the radiological disasters in the southern Urals, and the whole world finally found out about Lake Karachay, the Mayak nuclear facility, the Techa River, and the secret city of Chelyabinsk 40, or City 40. Interestingly, it was later All revealed that up. the CIA actually knew about Mayak and some of its major incidents since 1957, and had decided to keep it a secret to not cause concern among people living near nuclear facilities in the US. Which means, yes, the CIA actually helped the Soviet Union keep- Wow. I bet they did- did they even tell people that worked in the nuclear industry? Because it, it would behoove any sort of lessons learned about waste storage or anything. That's one of the reasons why the organization INPO or WANO, INPO being the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations and WANO being the World Association of Nuclear Operations. The whole reason why those agencies exist is to share knowledge from nuclear accidents to ensure they do not happen again. INPO was formed after the Three Mile Island and their standards for safety far, far greater than the the regulators, the federal government, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Having your plant in order pass those inspections, easy. INPO, because it's not just about absolute safety, it's about continuous improvement culture and how you are relative to other power plants in the world. That's why it's so much, it's so much harder. It's because it's, it's now a competition. Keep its early nuclear catastrophes a secret. Now, after the Soviet collapse, the Russian government officially recognized their secret cities as legitimate places on the map. City 40 was able to get legal status in 1994 and was renamed the city of Azyorsk, though still with barbed wire fences and guarded gates. It's still heavily restricted and extremely secretive. Not? But if you're somehow able to get in, you'd be treated to picturesque scenery and beautiful lakes. You'd see mothers pushing newborns in prams. Lakes where all the radioactivity has decayed away and there's no additional inflow of radioactive waste. Children playing in the streets, local women selling fresh fruit and vegetables, much of it resembling a suburban American town from the 1950s. But if you look closely, you'd see a different reality. The Aziosk residents know the truth. Yeah. Their food is poisoned. The water is contaminated. Their children are sick, and much of their picturesque surroundings remain no-go zones. The seemingly pristine lakes beg for a swim, but stay- Yeah, that's, that's crazy. And it's all the people still living there. It's a big contrast to the Chernobyl exclusion zone where everyone knows about it. Yeah, a few people still live there, but here it's, it's kind of backwards. Standing even lakeside at Lake Karachay would give you a sufficiently lethal dose of radiation in only an hour. Imagine if you were to swim in it. So I'm familiar with that source. That source was from was an estimate from 1990. I highly doubt the dose rate is that high now because additional monitoring programs have been put in place since. But still don't go swimming in it as you're just asking for trouble. Average in Azyorsk, you can expect to live to the age of 50. 
comparable to countries with the lowest life expectancy rates. This all could have been avoided, of course, if scientists working at Mayak all those years ago had at least the basic understanding of the physics of nuclear energy and the processes involved with chain reaction. More so just the nuclear safety aspect. I mean, I'm sure they knew the science they were able to make nuclear nuclear reactors, but it's it's the nuclear safety aspects. Or I don't know if they didn't know it or if they just didn't care. I wonder about that. This was a very well done video by Kento Bento. This was a video that was recommended to me. I've never watched this channel before. Thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.